That is all in for this evening. The Rachel Maddow Show starts right now. Good evening, Rachel. Good evening, Chris. Thanks, man. And thanks to you at home for staying with us for the next hour. Just outside of Nashville, Tennessee, about 60 miles outside of Nashville, there is a tiny little city called Waverly. Waverly, Tennessee is a city of only about a, a few thousand people. But on February 24th, 1978, what happened in Waverly, Tennessee was the top story in the country. Good evening. There has been a major disaster in Waverly, Tennessee, caused by explosions in two derailed railroad cars containing propane. At least 140 people were injured, we are told, and civil defense officials were quoted as saying the number of dead could rise as high as 40. No one is sure, but it's a very big disaster. The explosion was so powerful it could be felt three miles away. Workmen were trying to transfer the propane from one tank car to trucks when it blew up and set off the blast in the other tank car. Three blocks of the city of Waverly were badly damaged by this afternoon's explosions. Waverly has 6,000 people. They were evacuated today. The entire city of Waverly, Tennessee, all 6,000 residents uh, had to be evacuated because of that explosion. That rail car explosion ultimately killed 16 people, including Waverly's police chief and Waverly's fire chief. That was February 24th, 1978. And then two days later, it happened again. Good evening. In a little more than 48 hours, there have been three railroad tank car accidents in southeastern United States. Before dawn this morning, another derailment in Youngstown, Florida, punctured a tank car, sending chlorine gas into the air and killing at least eight people. More than 60 people are in the hospital, some of them in critical condition. Kenley Jones reports from Florida. The train which derailed this time was a southbound freight of the Atlanta and St. Andrews Bay Railroad a small line which operates between Dothan, Alabama and Panama City, Florida. A tank car carrying poisonous chlorine gas was ruptured in the wreck. A deadly mist of gas spread from the tank car. Motorists who were driving at night alongside the tracks were caught by surprise. Most of the victims who died were found in their cars along U.S. Highway 231. People killed by poison gas like they were on a battlefield in World War I or something instead of just driving their cars along a U.S. highway. Amazing. After that rail car accident uh, in Florida and another one that same day in Tennessee and the other one that happened in Waverly, Tennessee, two days before that, federal investigators starting to look into whether this was maybe more than a coincidence. Maybe there was some sort of systemic problem at hand. One after another around the country, trains have been running off the tracks, turning over and often releasing from their ruptured tank cars chemicals of one kind or another, some of them dangerous. It seems to be an almost daily or weekly routine, and there was a congressional hearing about this today. During that hearing in 1978, dozens of witnesses testified about these rail cars that seemed to be blowing up one after the other all over the country. The hearing included local mayors, local emergency response personnel, executives from the railroad companies, as well as officials from the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board. That's the federal agency that's called in to investigate these sorts of accidents when they happen. And what they found, what they testified about that day, was that it was not just a coincidence that all of these tanker cars carrying toxic and hazardous chemicals were exploding all around the country. There was a problem, they said, and it was the tanker cars themselves. There are 20,000 so-called jumbo tank cars in use, but only a few carry the latest safety equipment intended to prevent tank cars from breaking open. The railroads claim it costs too much and takes too long to install. The safety board, in a demonstration outside the hearing room, installed the devices on a tank car mock-up in less than 30 minutes. The cost of converting all 20,000 railroad tank cars in the country with this new safety device could run as high as 30 to $35 million. But according to the National Transportation Safety Board, the cost of not converting, in terms of lives and property lost, could be much higher. The railroad cars that were in use at that time, the ones that were transporting things like propane and chlorine gas all over the country, these tanker cars that were exploding, they were exploding in part because their shells were too thin and they could be easily punctured when they were bumped or knocked or when they flipped over in a crash. 
after that string of disasters in the 1970s, those tanker cars got an upgrade thanks to that public prodding and that public demonstration publicity stunt from the NTSB. Those tanker cars were upgraded with puncture-resistant shields and fire-resistant insulation and safety devices that kept the individual cars intact after a derailment so pieces wouldn't fly off and puncture other cars. But those upgrades were specifically done for tanker cars that were pressurized, pressurized cars that were hauling hazardous materials around the country and that not incidentally had been frequently blowing up like Ford Pintos. The pressurized cars got upgraded. As for the non-pressurized cars, they didn't get upgraded. And maybe that was fine when they were carrying around non-hazardous stuff like corn syrup or vegetable oil. But there was no rule in place that said that those less safe, unpressurized cars had to only carry benign safe stuff. They were also allowed to carry hazardous stuff, like, say, nitric acid. Take it away, reporter Chris Wallace. A cloud of poisonous gas forces thousands of people in Denver to evacuate their homes. The emergency started early this morning in a railroad yard north of downtown Denver. A tank car with 20,000 gallons of nitric acid was ruptured in a freak switching accident. When the acid hit the air, an orange cloud of nitric dioxide gas started forming. Air raid sirens were used to alert people, and a massive evacuation started. That was April 1983 in Denver, Colorado. Very scary. After that accident, the NTSB concluded that had that specific type of rail car been one of the upgraded ones, quote, the tank car probably would not have been punctured, and the release of the material probably would not have occurred. A year after that disaster, the same type of tank car derailed and exploded in Marshville, North Carolina. That fire destroyed three buildings and led to the evacuation of more than 2,000 people. A year after that, another train derailment, this time in South Carolina. A freight train derailed and then one of the tanker cars that was carrying toxic chemicals burst into flames, forcing the evacuation of more than a dozen homes in the area. And then it was Helena, Montana. Rail cars loaded with hydrogen peroxide exploded and burst into flames after an unattended train rolled down a hill and slammed into another locomotive at a rail yard nearby. 2,000 people were ordered out of their homes. The hydrogen peroxide explosion in Helena blew out nearly all the windows at a nearby college. Each of these individual accidents involved human error or mechanical failure to some degree in terms of what caused the initial derailment. But the explosions that happened after the derailments and the spread of those toxic chemicals, in all of those cases, the culprit seemed to be this really simple thing, this outdated rail car. And the NTSB was screaming about it at the top of its lungs, screaming that this needed to be addressed, that these cars needed to be fixed. They needed to be made more puncture resistant so this stopped happening. But the NTSB cannot force that to happen. They just make safety recommendations. Finally, in July 1991, the NTSB, which had been investigating all these accidents, finally they wrote to the Federal Railroad Administration in 1991 and said, you know what, we really have a problem here. These tank cars, which are now carrying all sorts of hazardous material around the country, these cars that never got upgrades like the pressurized cars did, they are providing, quote, inadequate protection. And that has been, quote, evident for many years now. That was July 1st, 1991. And this was two weeks later. A large stretch of the Sacramento River was closed to fishermen today, and it may be years before it's back to normal, all because of a devastating accident. On July 14th, seven cars from a Southern Pacific train went off the tracks into the river. One car spilled over 19,000 gallons of weed killer. By the next morning, a green poisonous slime began a 45-mile killing journey. As he watches trains pass by, Roy Hale thinks it's time to put pressure on railroads, chemical companies, and the government. Maybe we ought to look at what's moving through our cities and how that stuff is, is protected and how those tanks are made. Maybe we ought to start looking at how those tanks are made. That's an excellent idea. And that is what the NTSB, for decades, had been asking, pleading with the federal government to do. Because it's clear that the industry apparently was not going to do it itself. Couldn't somebody make them do it? This past January, the news agency McClatchy rounded up all these examples of rail car accidents involving this exact type of tanker car over the last three decades. There are a ton of these examples, including one that shut down the Holland Tunnel in New York City for nearly two days. 
And this one specific model of rail car is essentially the common denominator in all of these accidents. And there are tens of thousands of these rail cars out there right now. After that type of rail car kept exploding while transporting things like hydrogen peroxide and methanol, about 10 years ago, these cars started to be used in really large numbers to move ethanol, the plant-based fuel that's often blended into gasoline. Ethanol got a big boost policy-wise in the mid-2000s, and that meant a lot more of it was being moved around the country. These unsafe cars were the cars that did the lion's share of that work. And ethanol, you know what, is pretty explosive. That's the whole point of why you can mix it into fuel. And filling tens of thousands of these prone-to-explode soda can rail cars, filling them full of ethanol, that did nothing to stop our nation's explosion problem. After a 2006 derailment and explosion outside of Pittsburgh, the NTSB again said, hey, these tanker cars are a problem. After a 2009 derailment and explosion in Illinois, that one killed a driver who was just waiting at a railroad crossing for the train to pass. The NTSB again cited the deficiencies of this one specific tanker car as a contributing factor in that accident. So these tanker cars, they blow up when hauling chlorine gas, they blow up when hauling nitric acid, they blow up when hauling hydrogen peroxide, they blow up when hauling ethanol. Guess what they're hauling these days? It's not hard to guess. The massive inferno sent flames into the night sky, fueled by crude oil from ruptured tank cars. The runaway, unmanned 73-car train derailed about 1 a.m., sparking a fire and explosions that shattered the quiet of this lake town 135 miles north of the main border. What's it look like? War, uh, war zone? Uh, a lot of buildings burns. By daybreak, the skies were still black with thick smoke, visible for miles. Last summer, it was a small lake town in Quebec, just over the U.S. border, uh, which found out what happens when this specific type of rail car is allowed to transport crude oil. Uh, that derailment and inferno in Lac Megantic wiped out uh, nearly all the downtown area and killed 47 people on the ground. That disaster in Lac Megantic showed what can happen not only when this outdated model of rail car is transporting crude oil, but specifically what can happen with this outdated rail car transporting crude oil from North Dakota. Because by a cruel twist of fate, the crude oil that we extract from North Dakota turns out to be extra flammable, extra explosive. Just a few months after that derailment nearly wiped out that whole town in Canada, something more closely resembling Armageddon was visited upon the residents of the town of Castleton, North Dakota, just outside Fargo, North Dakota. That derailment and explosion forced the evacuation of two-thirds of the town, and when the NTSB came to investigate, what they discovered on the scene was, yes, the charred wreckage of those same outdated rail cars that had been failing like clockwork for decades now. And here's the amazing part. After decades of accidents like that happening in every corner of our country and across the border in Canada as well, the railroad and chemical and tanker industry, they did finally voluntarily commit to making these rail cars safer. They said they would upgrade them with thicker shells and shields on the ends to try to prevent punctures. So even the industry itself now recognizes that there is a problem here. But because nobody's making them change and they are setting their own terms, look at this. They only committed to the upgrades for rail cars that were built after October 2011. The ones that were built before that, eh, we'll take our chances, leave them on the rails. When the industry proposed that, the NTSB, which probably at this point feels like it's living in the twilight zone, uh, the NTSB said no, 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 no. The higher safety standards have to apply to all of these tanker cars, the ones built before October 11th, uh, before October 2011, they're, they're going to have to be either retrofitted or phased out. You have to stop rolling these bombs through every city and town in America. To that suggestion, the industry representative said the NTSB was overreacting. They said it would cost way too much money. And besides, they said the threat of a serious accident was way overstated. Quote, it's more likely you're going to be hit by lightning. That's what they said. Well, lightning is not just striking in Lac Megantic, Quebec, and Castleton, North Dakota. Lightning also struck in Alabama last November, where these outdated rail cars caused an explosion that led to the release of 748,000 gallons of crude oil. Lightning then struck in New Brunswick in Canada in January, where a number of the cars that derailed and exploded were those older model tanker cars that were not built to the newer standards. 
And then lightning struck again last month in Lynchburg, Virginia, when a train carrying crude oil derailed and its tanker cars exploded and they leaked their flaming toxic contents into the James River. The investigation into that crash is still ongoing, but just a week before that crash, literally a week before, the outgoing chair of the NTSB was again trying desperately to sound the alarm on this issue. She said that the Obama administration needed to take immediate steps to protect the public from potentially catastrophic oil train accidents, even if it meant using emergency authority. She said federal regulators have the power to issue emergency orders to protect the public rather than run the risk of another accident happening before new regulations can be put in place. She said, quote, the rules are not moving fast enough. We don't need a higher body count before they move forward. And then a week to the day after she said that, the city of Lynchburg, Virginia, became the latest symbol of this slow motion public policy disaster. There were roughly 10,000 rail cars full of oil moved through the United States the year before President Obama was sworn in. Last year, it wasn't 10,000 cars, it was over 400,000 cars full of oil. And the industry says they expect that to go up by another 50% this year. We are in the middle of a huge oil boom in this country, and bully for us. But one big public policy consequence of that for the rest of us who aren't in the oil industry is that oil trains turn out to be bombs that roll right through our population centers all day, every day, not very far away from us humans at all. And the cars they put the oil in are not safe to put the oil in. And we know that because they keep blowing up. And they have been for decades. The federal agency that can do something here, the agency that could mandate, for instance, that the industry upgrade its cars, not just the new ones, but the old ones too, the agency that can do that is the Transportation Department. The night of that derailment and explosion in Lynchburg, Virginia, that same night, the Transportation Department finally submitted to the White House a long-awaited package of rules aimed at improving the safety of oil transport by rail. Those rules have not been made public yet. The White House says it's in the process of reviewing them right now. But in the meantime, these tanker cars are still out there, still crisscrossing the country. This type of rail car is the workhorse of the industry, and it apparently cannot safely transport all of this oil that we're now producing hand over fist in this country and transporting using those cars. We're doing it anyway. We're just trying anyway, even though we know the risks, even though we see the risks. Last week, as the Transportation Department is waiting to find out what's going to happen with its new rules, the Transportation Secretary, Anthony Fox, announced that these rail cars are essentially not fit for service. He issued a safety alert advising the industry to no longer use that type of rail car for transporting oil. But that is a piece of advice that is completely voluntary for the industry. That advice doesn't require the industry to do anything. It's just an alert. Hey, we know what you're doing isn't safe. If the oil industry does not stop using these rail cars, which apparently are unfit for service, what will the federal government do then? Joining us next is the Transportation Secretary himself, Anthony Fox. Please stay with us.